So I'm going to talk to us today about getting to know the neighbors and about our nearby galaxies. And as Manik said, uh, most of my work has been looking at our own Milky Way galaxy in the past. And recently, I've started to go a little bit further afield and step out of our own galaxy and try to understand the neighbors and the things around us. So I'm going to bring up my screen here and um, see if you can see my slides. So hang on just a minute. So as I said, I'm going to talk about exploring the Magellanic Clouds, which are the some of the nearest galaxies to ours, um, and certainly the most spectacular to look at because we can see them with our own eyes just standing outside uh, if you live in the southern hemisphere. So the picture that you can see there is a picture of the small Magellanic Cloud, which is one of the, the two Magellanic Clouds. They're creatively named the large and the small Magellanic Cloud because one looks big and the other one looks small. Astronomers are not really very clever with their naming of things. Sometimes we can be a bit dull. Um, but before I, I talk too much about the galaxies themselves, I thought since this is uh, an online event, it's nice just to show a bigger picture of me um, and talk a bit about what I do. So I am, as you heard, a professor at the Australian National University um, and my research area is specializes in using radio telescopes like the ones that you can see around the picture of me there. Uh, my favorite radio telescope in all the world is the Parkes telescope, which is the center picture there, which seems to be growing out of the top of my head. The Parkes Telescope is, is also called the DISH, and it's a 64 meter telescope. So if you imagine being um, at an Olympic sized swimming pool, that's 50 meters, and this is a bit bigger than that across. And it can move to almost any point in the sky, pointing at any point in the sky. One of the great things about being an astronomer is you get to go to all kinds of other interesting places to visit other interesting telescopes. So the picture down on the bottom left is me uh, in front of a telescope in China, which is a very new telescope called FAST. It's the uh, 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. So that analogy I gave you before about your swimming pool, your Olympic swimming pool. Um, well, this one is 10 Olympic swimming pools across. So it is an absolutely enormous telescope. Uh, and then by contrast on the other side is the telescope uh, in South Africa called Meerkat. And it does actually have Meerkats, the fuzzy little animals around it. Um, but the telescope is made up of, uh, of 64 small dishes that are 15 meters each. So those are just some of the radio telescopes that I use around the world. Um, and some of the things that I do with them is what I'm going to tell you about over the next half an hour. Uh, so my field of research looks at our own galaxy and the Magellanic Clouds, which you can see beautifully in this picture here. Uh, this is taken uh, at the Very Large Telescope site in Chile. And you can see the band of the Milky Way stretching from one side of the sky to the other. And then you can see two little blobs uh, up in the left-hand side, and those little blobs are the blobs of the Magellanic Clouds. So the Magellanic Clouds are some of the nearest galaxies to us. Um, but I wonder, does everybody know what a galaxy is? wonder if you could just think about what you think of when you think of a galaxy. So when I think of a galaxy, I think of a lot of stars. I think of something that's got maybe a billion, 10 billion, 100 billion, 1,000 billion stars. Great, so somebody thinks it's a group of stars. Well, what are those stars doing? How are they, are they just sitting there? Or are they moving? What are they, what are they doing? Yes, so somebody's saying a mass of stars orbiting a body with a large gravitational pull, perfect. So you can have a black hole the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, which is in fact almost right in the center of this image, that band of stars that you see with the dark bits through it, right in the center is a black hole. And our sun is going around that black hole as is everything else in our galaxy. And I love the analogy that it, the, the galaxy is like a family. A family of stars is a wonderful way to put it. And I think I'm going to use that one if I can, Miss Hannah Seven. 
Um, so our galaxy is a very big galaxy. It's a galaxy that is sort of a big bully in the neighborhood. But most galaxies in the universe are not big and most of them don't really have big black holes in them either. Um, and a lot of them are not even orbiting around each other. The stars are not moving around in a clear way. Sometimes they're moving in a very disrupted way. And those galaxies can be called dwarf galaxies, meaning they're small galaxies. Um, they can sometimes be irregular galaxies. So they means that they don't look like a nice smooth disk of stars, but they can be all kinds of different structures. So inside our neighborhood, uh, of our galaxy is the big one. So the, the Milky Way is the big galaxy. And in this picture here, this is an artist's impression of what the Milky Way might look like. It's down on the left hand side. But there's a lot of other galaxies that are around in this area called the local group. And so these are sort of like you, all the friends of your family, you know, and maybe it's your aunts and your uncles and your cousins and all of them. Uh, there are a bunch of different galaxies that live around our own. And the two most interesting to me are the large and the small Magellanic clouds. So the large Magellanic cloud is about 180,000 light years away from us. And the small Magellanic cloud is about 210,000 light years. So remembering that a light year is how long it takes the light, it's how far the light goes in one year. So anything that we look at in the large Magellanic cloud, whenever we're looking at light that's coming from that, it left that galaxy 180,000 years ago. So for a long time, we thought that the large and the small Magellanic clouds were the nearest galaxies to us. Um, they were the big ones that we could see. When you, if you are lucky enough to live in the Southern Hemisphere, like I do, you can see them in the night sky and you can see them with your eyes and they look like clouds. It looks like it could be an otherwise perfectly clear night. You see lots and lots of stars. And then there's this one place where it looks like, oh no, the clouds are coming in and blocking the stars. But in fact, those are galaxies filled with stars themselves. So until 1994, we thought the large and small Magellanic clouds were the closest galaxies to us. And then uh, we discovered the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. <clears throat> which is 70,000 light years away from us. So it's much closer. And I saw in the chat before we started talking that somebody asked what the closest galaxy was and a bunch of people were coming up with answers. And I saw somebody say the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. And you were exactly right from 1994 until 2003, we thought it was the closest galaxy to us. And then in 2003, astronomers discovered Canis Major, which is only 42,000 light years away from us. And it's basically just at the very edge of the Milky Way. Um, so these, these are some of our closest neighbors. But the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud are the biggest of those four close galaxies. So both of them are the kind of big, bigger ones and a little bit easier to look at and to understand about them. So what do they look like? Um, so these are images made from uh, optical and from infrared telescopes of the large on the left-hand side and the small Magellanic Cloud on the right-hand side. So you can think of the sort of the large Magellanic Cloud being the next door neighbor. It's the house that's right next door to yours. It's pretty big, you know uh, quite a bit about it. You know the people, the kids who live there and you know where their kitchen is and how to get around inside the house. And then there's the next next door neighbor, which is the small Magellanic Cloud in our case. And it's a bit further away. You know those kids there, but you don't know them quite as well because you don't play with them as much because they're just a little bit further down the street. Um, so that's kind of how we are with the large and the small Magellanic Clouds. We know a lot about the LMC, the large Magellanic Cloud, and a fair amount about the SMC, the Small Magellanic Cloud, but not quite as much. So the large galaxy, the large Magellanic Cloud, 
has 10 billion times the mass of the sun in that galaxy. Whereas the small one has six and a half billion times the mass of our sun in it. So they're not exactly tiny. I mean, they do have a lot of stars, they have a lot of gas and they have a lot of things in them. Neither one of them have any substantial black holes that we know about. Um, there are probably small black holes, but there's nothing clear uh, that we have detected that's in the form of a, a massive or a supermassive black hole like we see in our own Milky Way. Um, so what else do we know about them? Well, I'll just take a little brief divergence and tell you about radio telescopes because some of the best things that we know about radio tele about the large and the small Magellanic clouds come from what we have learned with radio telescopes. So radio telescopes, they look like big satellite dishes. Um, you might have seen big satellite dishes on top of buildings that are trying to, to track what's happening with satellites above. You may have been, if you live in the ACT, you may have been out to the NASA Deep Space Tracking Station and seen the satellite dishes that are there, which are tracking NASA's satellites as they move out into space or their deep space missions. Um, these radio telescopes observe at frequencies or, or at wavelengths that we can't see with our eyes. Um, they're at frequencies that are closer to the frequencies of your radio in your car um, or a little bit higher than that. And one of their great aspects is that you can spread them out to make a really, 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 really good image so that you can see things in much higher detail than you can um, with a telescope that would just be one big telescope. So this is a radio telescope that is pictured here. And it's one of the brand newest ones. It's a 2020 model radio telescope built in Western Australia. So if anybody here is calling in from Western Australia, you're very lucky to have a very nice radio telescope there. And it's made up of 36 12 meter dishes. Um, and they have a field of view, which means that how much the sky they can see, that is 150 times the size of the full moon. So the full moon, you take your hand, you put your arm straight out, full moon's about that big on the sky. Imagine 150 of your fists. And that's how much of the sky these telescopes can see at one time. So let me ask you, I'll just uh, have you guys open up the chat. Let me ask you, why do we build our telescopes in remote Western Australia? What might be the reason for that? Well, no cities is a good answer. Why would we want to be away from the cities? It's not actually light pollution, although that's a really good um, point. If we were using optical telescopes, it would be uh, because of light pollution. But these are radio telescopes. Um, so it's not really light pollution, but radiation, exactly. So we're looking for radio pollution. You got it. Well, what kinds of things make radio pollution? What would be the things we're looking to get away from? Anybody have any ideas? Cars and radios, somebody said, that's exactly right. Cars and radios, radio networks, like your FM radio station, um, microwaves, good one, excellent, excellent TVs, a digital TV, which is how we all look at things. Phones, exactly. iPads, perfect. Anybody have a Fitbit out there that you wear on your wrist? Your Fitbit causes radio frequency interference to us. So if you go to this telescope out here, you have to leave your Fitbit behind. All digital and technological advancement is correct. You guys have got it, absolutely. So radio frequencies are interfered by all of our digital devices that we have. We have our Bluetooth that connects up um, my little earphones that I'm wearing right now are connected to my computer in order to transmit my voice. They are transmitting at a radio frequency signal, just like what you would see with a radio telescope. My car outside has Bluetooth. My mobile phone has Bluetooth. All of these are problems 
for our radio telescopes. And in fact, they are massive problems for our radio telescopes because your Fitbit, if you go out to this telescope, is stronger in its signal than anything we can see from anywhere else in the universe. So it, they are extremely problematic for us. So we build our telescopes out in the middle of nowhere, as far away from people as we possibly can, so that we can have a clear radio sky. Because the amount of energy coming in radio waves from the universe, all of the radio telescopes in the world for the last 70 years while well, they've been collecting radio data, the amount of energy that they have collected is less than the amount of energy of a single snowflake landing on the ground. So it's very, very, very weak signals. Okay, so since I've beaten that one to a pulp, let's say uh, here, why do we, there we go, what do we want to look at? So when we use our radio telescopes, we get a slightly different view of the sky than we do when we use our optical telescopes or just our eyes. So this is a picture of the Milky Way as you might see it uh, with your eyes from a place like Canberra where I live now. So yeah, you look up in the sky, you can see that there's a bunch of stars, there's a, a bunch of bands of gas that are sort of dark places there, but you don't see a lot. And then you get a really good telescope like some of the telescopes um, that are in Chile, that are high up on mountains where they have very little light pollution, they have clear atmospheres. And there you can see the Milky Way in beautiful glory, and you can see the Magellanic Clouds right in the center of that, that night sky image. But then we take our radio telescope, so it's like we put our radio eyes on, and we look at the Milky Way with our radio eyes, and it looks really, really different. So instead of just looking like a thin Milky Way and tiny little galaxies for the large and small Magellanic Clouds, we see with our radio eyes that the, the Milky Way is very big and broad and the galaxies, the large and the small Magellanic Clouds are not just two little places, but they're two places that are connected to each other and then have some big, huge stream of gas coming off behind them. And so when we look with our radio eyes, we're seeing a, a much more detailed picture of what's going on with our nearby neighbors. So what are we looking at with these radio eyes? Well, what we're looking at is actually the interstellar matter. Uh, so interstellar matter is the stuff that's between the stars, and it's about 10% of all of the, the visible matter. Now, that doesn't mean it's 10% of all matter, because of course, all of you out there, you're very smart and educated young stars, you all know about dark matter. And I'm not talking about dark matter, I'm only talking about the visible matter. And 10% of that um, is interstellar matter. It's the things between the stars, and it's the things of which stars are made. But most of it is, um, uh, hydrogen gas, so most of it, that's the most abundant atom, and its density is very, 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 very low. So the density is 0 0.001 or up to a million particles per cubic centimeter. So you take a cubic cent a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter, and you might have, if you're lucky, one atom in that cubic centimeter in the interstellar medium. And if it's very, very dense, you might have a million atoms. But by comparison, the air that we're all breathing, or at least I hope you're breathing, uh, here on Earth has 10 to the 19, so that's one with 19 zeros after it, molecules in every cubic centimeter. So much, much denser. Or another way to think about it is that if you ran from here to the nearest star with a butterfly net the size of a football field, so a really, really, really big net, and you tried to gather up everything you could. You gather everything from outside of the, the Earth all the way to the nearest star, you would get one gram of material if you avoided the planets, that is. So there's not a lot out there, but most of it's hydrogen. And hydrogen is something that we can see brilliantly 
with our radio eyes. So hydrogen has a little signature. It produces a particular frequency line at 1420 megahertz, which sits um, a little bit below your Bluetooth, um, below your microwave, but above your FM radio. And the, that particular line, it's like a, a radio station. You can dial into this particular line. And it, when it's moving, if the hydrogen is moving with respect to us, it's Doppler shifted. And that changes the frequency or the pitch of it. Just like when you ha hear an ambulance and it's coming towards you, uh, its pitch is different than when it's going away from you. It might be like, and it changes as it goes away. So the same thing happens with this radio frequency line is that it changes its frequency when it's moving with respect to us. And from that, we can measure its velocity, how fast it's going. And that tells us so much more than we get when we just look at the sky. So one of the problems that we have when we are astronomers is that we just look at the sky and it's just a picture on the sky, but we don't know what's happening up in it. But if we can say something about the velocity, about the speed at which that gas is moving, then it tells us a lot more about what's happening. So in fact, depending upon which set of eyes you put on for looking at a galaxy, in this case, we're looking at the, the Whirlpool galaxy. If you put on your radio eyes, it looks like what it does on the left. If you put in your infrared eyes, you get the next image over. Your visual eyes, the opticals, what it looks like in the center picture. And if you head all the way over to your X-ray eyes, you can see what that galaxy looks like in X-rays. And it looks similar in all of these, but different. And by putting them all together, we get a much better picture of what a galaxy is actually doing. So if we take that and we know that our radio eyes see something different than our optical eyes, what can we learn about our neighbors, the Magellanic Clouds, when we put on our radio eyes? So first of all, what do the Magellanic Clouds look like? So I'll bring you to the, the small Magellanic Cloud first. Um, so this is the image that's on the far right, that's the one I showed you earlier, but this is what it looks like in a few different types of tracers. So just the stars, that's on the left-hand side, the dust, which is the stuff that's in between stars um, that's very heavy and messy, that's in the middle, and then quite warm gas, so stuff between the stars um, and around stars, that's on the right-hand side. And when we put on our radio eyes and we look at the hydrogen gas, this is what it looks like. Uh, so this is one of the best new pictures that we've made of the small Magellanic Cloud using that telescope out in remote Western Australia that I showed you earlier, as well as my favorite telescope, the Parkes Dish. And we get this beautiful picture of the small Magellanic Cloud. Now, if I can just try, for two seconds, I'm going to try to annotate something on here. Uh, let's see. Oh, I can't. Okay, never mind. I'll just carry on and we'll um, look at the, the movie here. So I said before that you can see the, the velocity of the gas. So this allows us to look at how a galaxy is moving. And that's what I'm showing you in this movie here. This is a, a movie of the gas that is changing around so we can see the small Magellanic Cloud and all how it's all moving with respect to us here on Earth. And it produces these beautiful, beautiful pictures um, that are three-dimensional. And that gives us an idea of what's going on in the galaxy. And some of the things that we can see about this galaxy is that it's actually sort of, it blows itself apart and makes a bit of a mess of itself. So the Large Magellanic Cloud, um, it looks a little bit different. If you look at it in the stars on the left-hand side, it's dominated by a, a bar of stars with a little bit of a sort of edges on that bar. And if you look at it in the dust, you see that it actually is a much rounder, fuller uh, image of that galaxy. And if you look at it in warm gas, you see a little bit to the to the right, which is 
you see it extends out a bit further, but not as far as the dust. And then when we put our radio eyes on um, and we look at it in its hydrogen gas, and it looks a lot like it does in the dust, um, but it's, a, it's sort of a blobby, patchy kind of structure there. So what if we bring all of those together and we take our radio eyes and we look at the large and the small Magellanic clouds all together? What we see is that the galaxies, when we look at their hydrogen gas, are connected to each other. So what we're looking at here is a picture of the, in the background in blue is the Milky Way in its optical. And in the pink is the hydrogen gas from a radio telescope of the Magellanic clouds. And the large Magellanic cloud is the bright blob of pink that's uh, sort of off to the right hand side and sticking up. It's the biggest bright blob. And the small Magellanic cloud is the next brightest blob of that pink. And you can see that the two galaxies are actually connected together with their hydrogen gas. And even more than that, the hydrogen gas extends off of those galaxies all the way, almost all the way around the Milky Way. And so this is called the Magellanic Stream. Uh, it was discovered in 1974, so long before you guys were born, born but not so long before I was born. Um, and it basically hasn't changed. We haven't discovered a lot new about it over the last uh, 46 years. These bits of gas have been pulled off by our own Milky Way galaxy. And basically these galaxies are being ripped apart by the Milky Way, which is a very nasty sort of bully. Um, and they're leaving their bits all over the place. So these are sort of the, the innards of the galaxies that have been spread all around the Milky Way. So another way of looking at it is to look at it this way. Um, so you can see I've labeled the large Magellanic cloud, the small Magellanic cloud. There's a bridge between them that connects those two galaxies because they're going like this around each other. Um, and the Magellanic stream and the leading arm are the bits of stuff that have been pulled out of those galaxies by our own Milky Way. So this uh, here on the, the left hand side is the entire hydrogen gas of our, our southern sky. So it's looking up and seeing the large and small Magellanic clouds. But the thing that I really wanted to show you was the bit on the right is a computer simulation of what we think happened when the large and small Magellanic clouds came flowing into the Milky Way. And this simulation shows how the galaxies get sort of pulled apart and they leave their mess behind them in the form of all that green and blue stuff that stretches off behind them. So the Magellanic clouds are a bit more than they look like they might be. With our optical telescopes and our, our own eyes, they look like they're just two isolated little galaxies that aren't really doing anything with our own. But in fact, they're dragging their bits all over the Milky Way, leaving bits of gas behind them as they move through the halo of our own galaxy. And so you might summarize by saying that the closest living neighbors are the large and small Magellanic clouds, and they're about 200,000 light years away. And when I say living neighbors, that's because the other two galaxies, which are closer than those, don't have active star formation. They're not forming any new stars. So they're kind of like dead galaxies. But the closest living ones are the large and small Magellanic clouds. They're about 200,000 light years away. They're really tiny. They're six to 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And by comparison, our own galaxy is one and a half trillion uh, times the mass of the sun. So they're quite small compared with our own galaxy. And they fling their stuff, their hydrogen gas, all over our garden. So their stuff is everywhere. They leave it all bits and bobs of junk every which way. But, we, as the Milky Way, will eventually buy them out, take them over, eat them up, and 
buy out their houses. So the Milky Way will be the end consumer of the large and the small Magellanic clouds. And I'll leave it there um, and let you ask lots of questions. <laughs>